Hey, Robin. Hey, Ellen. How you doing? I'm okay. How are you? Good. I got it figured out. You and El Cholo? Yep. I just finished my walk, so I'm a little sweaty. That's all right. No one can see. Thanks for being uh, here. Yeah, I want to get on early because I haven't done the Zoom for a while. So oh, to, yeah. To figure it out. I can see down here on the bottom, you can mute it. Yep. Stop the video. Or you can turn back on. Cool. Um, Robin, when you hover your mouse over your image, there's three, there's like a, a little ellipses in the top right. Say that again. There's a little icon of ellipses in the top right corner when you hover your mouse over your own image. Okay. And you can rename yourself. And uh, I would just add like a dash Robin Beaker dash chair or chair or something. And where do I do that? I click what? You hover your mouse over your own image and then oh. you'll see in the top right corner, there's an ellipses. Got it. Rename? Yep. And then who do we have from DTLA Strong on? Maybe they've stepped away from their computer. Were you chatting with them before? Who, me? Yeah. No. No, okay. Um, I'm gonna go grab myself some water, but I will be back shortly. You want me to do this outside? Sorry.
morning, Terry. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Okay. Looks like you're in the office. I am. I am. I am. How's downtown looking today? Better. Better. It was actually kind of this weekend was kind of busy. A lot of people around. So it was interesting. But um, slowly the boarding is coming off of every <laughs> building. So yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yep, yep. And I see your guys out there every day, so that's good. <laughs> yes, that is good. They're hard at work. Yes, they are. Hi, Lizeth. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Lulu. How's it going to be in the office, Lulu? Uh, it's a little strange, but I'm going to mute myself shortly because they're still doing construction on the outside so you guys can hear it. <laughs> but it feels great being outside the house. Oh, was that signed out on twice? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing well. How about you all? Doing okay. Where are you working from these days? Uh, partially remotely, partially from the office. Okay. And Lizeth, is the assembly uh, assembly member with you, or is he going to be logging on separately? So he, he will be logging on separately. So I did send him all the information. Um, so he'll be a, a few minutes. Um, Running a few minutes behind, but he'll be on shortly. Okay, great. I think um, introductions usually take a little longer on Zoom calls. Um, so he's got a little buffer. Okay, great, thank you. So Ellen, I'm probably gonna go on mute because I got restaurant background noise. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, announce at the top of the meeting and request that um, if folks Everybody are not that everybody mute themselves just because you know things tend to be louder for the for the group on a video call than you realize in your own home <laughs> good morning paul good morning how are you i'm doing well thank you I'm speaking very softly this morning nice because things tend to be louder on video calls <laughs> well, we appreciate your concern <laughs> for our eardrums. <laughs> Carrie, you'll get a kick out of this. You would not believe how evasive U.S. being right now on the football season at the Coliseum. That, I with, bet. With, with ticket holders and, you know, trying to bait and switch season ticket holders into going ahead and paying their, you know, paying for the tickets with no, re, no assurance that there's going to be any season at all. Yeah, it's been the same with, I'm a Rams season ticket holder. It's the same thing there. Everyone's complaining that they've paid, but it's like, of course you paid. It's for the season coming up, but yeah, they said they'll fully refund everybody if it doesn't, you know, spectator. So we'll see. Yeah, that's what, uh, that's what the university said too. Yeah. 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 
as a lesson from someone from St. Louis, don't trust Stan Kroenke for anything. <laughs> Hey, hey. Yeah, I, I he's not that bad. He's from, <laughs> he's from close to my town. <laughs> oh, that's Ben. Bob, we were in school with him. We were. Yeah. I even went out with his with his wife. Did you? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. He's from uh, he's from Mora, Missouri, which was about thirty miles east of Warrensburg, where I grew up. All right. About fifteen miles south of Sedalia. Yeah. It's so small, it doesn't even qualify as a hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> well, a friend of mine uh, works on the University of Missouri um, as a volunteer on fundraising. And, th and they went to see Stan and, and they said, uh, you know, how about making a donation? And he said, well, I'm still in the phase of accumulating money, not giving it away. <laughs> That sounds like Stanley. Yeah, yeah. All right, everyone. I'm glad to know that Zoom has not gotten in the way of the Missouri banter. It's Missouri. Uh, it's it Missouri. Is. Yeah, but uh, it is now 10.02. We have quorum, and I'd love to kick us off. So, Robin, will you do the honors? You got to unmute yourself, Robin, or I can do it for you. Actually, no, I can't. Here we go. Meeting go. in process, 1002. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Um, this is our, is it our third board meeting now that we're conducting virtually. Um, so far, so good. I think we've gotten the voting uh, system down. It's a little, a little wonky, but thanks for being troopers. Um, I'm going to ask that if you are not speaking, that you keep yourself muted. There's a lot of ambient noise that can create, <clears throat> excuse me, some uh, strange feedback for everybody listening in. Um, but if you do want to say something, there's a feature that allows you to raise your hand. Um, that you should see that. Let's see. Oh, you know what? We didn't set it up for this meeting, but you can actually raise your hand, or if you're calling in by phone, you can unmute yourself and just request to make a comment. Um, and forgive us, there, there will likely be some tech glitches, but we are doing our best to get through it. <clears throat> so, good morning and welcome to the South Park BID board meeting. We do have quorum. <clears throat> We're going to start off with uh, introductions. And I will... Uh, call you out on the screen. You can unmute yourself and give a quick intro. If you're a board member, please indicate so. And I'm just going to go in the order that I see you on my screen, which is likely different than what you see. So uh, just be listening for your name. Okay. Um, my name is Ellen Riotto. I'm the executive director of the South Park BID. Robin, I'll kick it over to you. Robin Beaker, board chair. Lulu, you're up. I'm Lulu Waldemary. I'm operations manager of South Park BID. Terry Tonys. Hi, Terry Tonys, member of the board and with the LA Auto Show. Paul Kovich. Yeah, hi, I'm a resident of uh, the Renaissance Towers. Thanks for being here, Paul. Paul Keller. Hi, I'm board member uh, and I'm with Mac Real Estate Group. Tom Shrout. Uh, Tom Shrout, I'm a resident of Luma, member of the board. Representing residents. Uh, Terry Rubenwright. Uh, Terry Rubenwright, member of the board, resident of DTOA South Park. Wallace. Wallace Locke, uh, South Park Bid, Director of Communications and Policy. Mr. Zeidman. Uh, Lee Zeidman, President of Staples Center, Microsoft Theater, and LA Live, and a board member. Victor. Victor Gonzalez, Director of Operations at South Park. Bob? Uh, Bob Bente, um, Board Treasurer and um, Property Owner. Dave? Dave Gordon, sorry. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, Dave Gordon, Board Member and Local uh, Property Owner and Developer. David Aguilar? David Aguilar, uh, Operations Manager for Clean and Safe. Uh, Jordan? 
Jordan Gulo, Property Manager, Onyx Apartments, proxy for Daniel Devon. John Nelson? Uh, John Nelson, resident of 1050. Uh, Mr. Assemblyman, Santiago, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I kind of gave your intro and you're going to have the floor in just a few. We're um, going around and doing introductions and we'll kick it over to you in a few. Thanks sure. for being here. Um, Mark Gonzalez is also joining. Hi, Mark. Hi. <laughs> Mark, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Uh, District Director for Assembly Member Santiago. Thanks for being here. Um, we've got someone from DTLA Strong. Do you want to say hi? Okay, Lizeth. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Lizeth of Assembly Member Santiago's office. And Kelly. Hi there, I'm a property manager for office building here in South Park, as well as a resident. Great to have you here, Kelly. Hey. Uh, Paul Chambers. I am the general manager of Avon Apartments, a South Park resident and uh, an employee of the Mac Real Estate Group. Laura. Hi, good morning. I'm a property owner and resident at Luma Lofts in South Park. I'm also a member on the uh, HOA at Luma. And May. Good morning. This is May Chen Tam, uh, YWCA Greater Los Angeles, proxy for Faye Washington, member of the board. Amara, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Good morning, Amara Anoni. Owner of Mar Mar Noy Event Design, DTLA resident and housing and homelessness uh, outreach coordinator. Susan? Uh, Susan Shum, California Hospital Medical Center, proxy for Patrick Castor. And Eureta? Hey, sorry, I was muted. Um, I'm Eureta Ramos with the City Clerk's Office. Thanks for being here, Eureta. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of folks. Calling in, I see a 213220 number. Yeah, it's uh, Patrick Castor, Ellen. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for being on. And now I see a 432 uh, 2100. That was me, Jordan. Oh, hi, Jordan. Sorry. Um, am I missing anyone? Good morning. Oh, this is. Daniel Tabon with Jade Enterprises and Vice President of the Board. Okay, I think we've got everyone. Um, that was relatively quick. Good job, everyone. Um, I have one important announcement before um, we move on to the agenda items, um, and I will ask if there are any public comments to uh, present them now. My announcement is that Victor Gonzalez is uh, hitting his one year anniversary with the bid as a staff member. So um, if we could all do some sort of congratulations, I don't know how we did on Zoom, but <laughs> um, today actually is his one year anniversary and we couldn't be more thrilled to have him on our team. Um, the whole district knows Victor. He's been with us for Victor 13 years, is that right? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> 13 years. Um, so Victor is your guy. For those of you who don't know, Victor is our director of operations. Um, he is where you go if you have any, any questions related to our um, maintenance and safety program. Victor, congratulations on one year. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to open it up to public comment. If you do have a public comment, please indicate so somehow, <laughs> either visually or uh, unmuting yourself. Okay, no public comment. Um, any other announcements before we move on to? Okay, um, item number three on our agenda. Is... Ellen, this is May. Hi, May. Uh, I just would like to let all the board members know that yesterday or day before yesterday, I did send them an invite about uh, YWCA's upcoming virtual uh, town hall. So I would uh, really encourage everyone to join in. It'll be a, a fantastic uh, panel. There's fantastic panel on that uh, town hall. Yeah, May, thanks so much for reminding us all about that town hall. That's tomorrow, I'm oh, sorry, Friday at 10 o'clock, I believe. Yes, 10 to 12. Okay, thank you for 
the reminder. <clears throat> um, YWCA <laughs> is hosting a series of events, virtual events um, called Standing in Solidarity, and they've got some really fantastic speakers. So um, if you can make it on Friday, I highly encourage it. All right, uh, num number three on our agenda is the review and approval of um, last board meeting's minutes. I did get a, uh, uh, an email this morning from Mr. Shrout who caught a typo. Item number six says the word crew and should say, Tom, are you gonna correct me on this one? It says clue and should say crew. Is that what it was? Typo, there's a typo in item number six. It should say crew. Um, it says, but other than that, it, it says it wishful thinking, cure. Yeah, it says cure, cure. correct. <laughs> Thank you for that catch. Um, we will make sure to amend that. Um, but if there are no other edits, do I have a motion to approve? I approve. Do I have a second? Second by me. Okay. Craig? Um, all those in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 If there are any abstentions or oppositions, please indicate that now. Okay, so moved. Thank you, board. We've got this down. That felt really good compared to the last time we tried that. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to our very special guest, um, Assembly Member Santiago, Miguel Santiago. We're so happy to um, have him here with us share. I've lost you on my screen, Assembly Member. Where have you? Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> okay. The guy with the green uh, shirt. I stick out. <laughs> and for those of you who uh, are on video, you can change the view on Zoom. So um, you can have speaker view or gallery view. And for this portion, I recommend speaker view. Take it away, uh, Mr. Sure. Santiago. Hey, thanks a lot for having me on. I really do appreciate it. Um, how about I just give a quick high level overview and then maybe go back and forth on a couple of issues that I think uh, are extremely important to our area and that's the issue of homelessness. But, but just kind of like to wrap things up you under, so that you get a bigger picture of what the state budget's going through because that seems to be the biggest question uh, that has arised every time I talk to a constituency group, uh, both in my district and outside of my district and it gets a little bit confusing, um, but just at a very, very high level. We began the year with, with a $6 billion uh, surplus. Uh, we had about uh, um, rainy day funds up to uh, close to 20 uh, billion. And keep in mind for this, I'll just use rounded numbers and, uh, to make it a little bit easier. Uh, and we looked like we had a pretty uh, robust state budget coming into this. Uh, as, all, as we all know, COVID hit, uh, was completely unexpected that, that it would have this sort of economic devastation or the contraction rates. Uh, and so what ends up happening is we have estimates that now at that time uh, took a look like $54 billion in deficit. And that's a significant number, $54 billion in state deficit. Uh, but before we left, um, let, me, let me backtrack for a second. If you take a look at what we did, we think we, it put us in a much better standing in terms of uh, comparison to the rest of the nation. Because when you take a look at what happened, uh, we did uh, in, in the middle of March, uh, a $1 billion framework uh, budget uh, bill uh, to the governor's desk. And then we put $100 million uh, also on the governor's desk with a framework. I I keep in mind, because it's always easy to Monday morning quarterback uh, what happened, but with the information that we had at that time, uh, we thought that that would suffice, uh, given what we knew about COVID, given what we knew about the economy. Uh, but nonetheless, still put us in the best position uh, in, in comparison to other states, because the governor was able to act very quickly uh, on, on behalf of our authority uh, to get things done. And that's when you saw, for example, uh, the first $150 million released uh, that was called Project Room Key to start moving people uh, up, uh, from being homeless into hotels or other, um, other, other shelters. Now, uh, LA at that first time got about $41 uh, million. Uh, and so we made sure, because we're working with the governor's office to ensure that we got a large share of, of the first 150. And that's why you were able to see uh, a significant movement of folks uh, into shelter immediately. The second thing that, that, that happened in that first order was, was the 1,300 uh, or so trailers. LA, again, got over, uh, got over close to half of those trailers 
uh, that were moved around the LA County area uh, to help house uh, folks who are homeless. Now, you move fast forward and I'll, I'll take you back to that $54 billion deficit. Uh, and the reason we go, we keep going back to that is because there's never been a number like this that we faced uh, in deficits, uh, even under the, the uh, Schwarzenegger years, Davis years, Brown years, this number has never hit. It's kind of like having the worst depression uh, in, in the last couple of hundred years and the um, Spanish flu all at the same time. So it's really unprecedented. Uh, so the governor comes out, uh, it's an optimistic budget that requires uh, some federal funding, uh, some wishful thinking on federal funding, some gimmicks. Yeah, there's gimmicks in it. And I don't think that anybody's been shy about saying that because if, if you don't defer some payments, uh, move, uh, suspend some payments, uh, use some gimmicks, uh, you end up with a $54 billion deficit. And that would be catastrophic to California's economy. And so the first budget laid out by the governor laid out at about $22 billion in deficit. Uh, the legislature had a more optimistic point of view saying, let's not cut until you actually have to. Uh, the, reason, the reason you hear this language is because as opposed to tax day being on April 15th uh, in the past, and then you'd have a much budget revise in May and we'd have accurate numbers to actually do a budget. Uh, it, it's safe to say, and I don't think anybody would be shy about, uh, about saying this in any municipal government uh, or state uh, across the country, you're starting to take a look at folks creating budgets on an assumption that certain numbers come in because tax day has now been moved to July 15th. And if July 15th is tax day and constitutionally you have to have a budget done uh, before June 30th, then yeah, you're going to make some assumptions. Uh, and we've been very clear and very honest with people about, uh, about our intent to, to, to make the best faith uh, effort to get a number that's as accurate as we possibly can. So so the legislature is a little bit more optimistic in terms of preventing cuts uh, on, on some assumptions of federal government dollars coming in, on some assumptions uh, of economic numbers being better, on assumption uh, on moving debts towards the future. Uh, and again, we'll admit, yeah, there's some gimmicks. Absolutely. But the, the alternative is drastically uh, making budget cuts. And believe me, you if, you, if you think the economy is having a hard time now, making those cuts would make it a lot harder uh, to rebound an economy, and we're conscious of that, um, and we've seen this happen in the past. So, uh, our efforts led to the governor moving from a a significant uh, cut in the budget to meeting us a little bit more uh, on our terms and reducing the the amount of cuts that would happen across the state of California. And this is this has implications up and down because yeah, we we've heard naysayers say, well, you got to cut fiscally, et cetera, but do you really want all those social programs cut? Do you really want uh, uh, unemployment benefits uh, uh, drastically cut? Do you really want the healthcare system cut? Absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, the impact on California would be much worse. Uh, and so we're trying to grapple with how to do that. So we'll sign a, a budget this Friday. Um, not the best, but not the perfect budget, but and, and we won't have that sort of budget with accurate numbers until we come back uh, after July 15th. And you may hear another conversation about, about the state honing down and, and uh, cutting down or increasing, depending on where the federal members land and depending on whether or not um, our assumptions are accurate about, uh, about revenue to the state. Now, having said that, this is where we land on the issue of homelessness. Most of you knew that we were pushing for $2 billion in homelessness funds and ongoing. Um, and I, and, you know, look, and I, I think it's fair to, to, to remind folks what the state has done in terms of delivering dollars. We did no place like home, significant amount of dollars that will come to the LA area. Uh, we did heat, significant amount of dollars will come to the LA area. HAP, uh, we're now uh, doubling down with, with the dollars this year and we wanted to make it a long-term uh, investment. And, and here's why. And I've said, and I think some of us have said this over and over and over. If you take a look at the issue of homelessness, it's the one place the state doesn't have uh, a continuous funding source and local municipalities have recently begun to have a funding source. So it's no wonder that you're going to continue to see uh, an increase in homelessness across the state or at local municipalities if there isn't any a, 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 if, and a revenue stream that addresses this. And it's pretty clear, right? You have education funding, you have public safety funding, you have transportation funding, you have healthcare funding. I mean, we can go on. The one place uh, that doesn't have any funding source is homelessness. So it's not, it's not rocket science. If you don't fund homelessness, then guess what? It will continue to increase. Bottom line. Uh, so, with the exception of 
of Los Angeles who recently, the Los Angeles region, right, in terms of HHH and H, uh, who recently started funding it, uh, it's no wonder that it, that, that it got to that number. And there's other factors, right? We could debate the other factors, et cetera. No doubt that, that the decrease in affordable, that there needs to be an increase in affordable housing. And no doubt, uh, no, no doubt that production needs to, to kick in. No doubt all those things are, are, are accurate. Uh, but for the sake of dollars uh, on homelessness, we just don't have them. And, and, a lot of, and many municipalities up and down the state don't. So it will continue to increase. Having said that, COVID hits. We were still very, we were still successful in accessing dollars. So our bill for two billion is still con uh, continuing to move, even though the budget uh, will will be signed this Friday, well, will be sent to the governor this Friday. So you'll hear about the legislature coming back. Here's what's in the budget as it relates to homelessness, and, and believe me, it's been it's been a bit of a challenge, uh, but we've gotten there. There'll be about, and I'll say about because anything can change between now and then, um, about six hundred uh, million left. Uh, for Project Room Key, and that'll be backfilled by federal funds, and we worked extremely hard to do that. Um, keep in mind that the governor originally had talked about 750 million uh, bypass in local municipalities. Uh, that number still stands uh, because we spent, remember I mentioned 150 million? The, uh, the remaining 600 million will be backfilled uh, through federal funds. It, it may change by, by a few 10 or, or 25, but we'll, we'll uh, We'll send, uh, we'll send your leadership uh, an update Friday if you want, uh, after we sign it or Monday. But, and we'll get a significant portion of, of that. The formula, I don't know if it's public yet, I know, uh, but, but it will be. And it, it, will be, it will be as generous as we were able to push for the LA region. On top of that, there'll be about 300 to 350 million out of general use dollars uh, that will allow uh, for, the, for the wraparound support services. And this is really important. Uh, and you guys read about it in a newspaper, right? The, the governor's office proposed Project Room Key, but we know in the LA area that it takes just more than housing, right? It takes all the wraparound support services. Uh, and, and obviously, if, if you've been on the street, more than likely in some cases, uh, depending on the population, there's mental health care issues, substance abuse issues. Uh, there's other social programming that needs to happen to help this person be successful uh, one, once in shelter. Uh, and we know that. And so we fought for those sort of dollars as well to be able to do that. Uh, some of those dollars could be used uh, in, in flexible uses, but nonetheless are, are meant to keep people and to help people uh, get housed immediately. And the other portion of the two that, that we were able to in, in put in there was flexible uses uh, of dollars that allow for homelessness. And here's why that's important to say, to say it in terms of flexible uses, uh, because we know that, that, that you know, and I'll, and I'll say this, at a high level um, that the easiest way to, to eradicate homelessness is to prevent people from um, landing on the street. I mean, that's not hard to figure out, right? And so the dollars that, that I've just mentioned at about one point, a little over, uh, right now they're about 1.3, but they may change. So let's just say over $1 billion will be flexible uh, to be used for homeless, but other things uh, that are related to COVID. So when we deliver those dollars to local municipalities, they'll be able to use it for like rental assistance, uh, uh, vouchers or other sorts of programs uh, that are COVID related. They could potentially use it for other things. Our intention uh, is always to write language uh, broad enough uh, to meet local application. Uh, but our hope is that it's used in a way that addresses the issue of, of homelessness. Uh, and then there's an additional uh, 500 million that, that we hope lands in Friday's budget. Uh, that, that breaks down uh, to municipalities that are less than 300,000 uh, 300, in population. Uh, and, though, and the other 250 million will go to uh, municipalities uh, that are over 300,000 in population, but didn't receive federal funds. Because LA, the LA region got a significant amount of federal funds. Uh, this is all a long way of saying um, that we were successful in getting significant amounts of dollars in a budget that still saw the potential of a $54 billion deficit uh, to address the issue of homelessness. Um, now, if you all are sitting there saying, well, we're not seeing any change. My frustration, your frustration is the same frustration uh, that I felt. Uh, we've been on the same page uh, on that. That's, that. that's the tough news to swallow. The, the, um, the promising part though, is that we saw uh, when the governor, um, release the dollars that, that we uh, sent to him, the first 150, 
that the region was moving at a neck break pace. Uh, so now we know uh, that it is absolutely completely possible uh, to move at speeds uh, that weren't possible in the past. Uh, so now that we know that that's possible, um, we, we expect uh, support and we'll work with, with, with our local um, counterparts uh, to ensure that they continue to move at, at that uh, neck break speed uh, to address the issue of homelessness um, as it relates to both of those, those people who are, who are uh, living on our streets, who we want to help uh, in the most desperate manner, and, and, and also the prevention of people who land on the streets, uh, because that's now something that is facing us in, in a real serious way. Uh, and we used to say that people were one paycheck away uh, from landing on the street. Well, now during the era of COVID, uh, they're, they're three, four, five, six, seven paychecks behind uh, and, are, and are going to land on the streets. And we're seeing the population change. Uh, it used to be that folks would say, well, it, you know, we see homeless population in downtown, uh, but now we're starting to, in, for some time now, but now with, with much greater uh, magnitude, we're starting to see people uh, who traditionally we wouldn't expect to be living on the streets, uh, families, and uh, we're starting to see couples, uh, we're starting to see them under passes, we're starting to see people uh, in cars, uh, RVs, and they're not just isolated uh, to, to downtown Los Angeles, but I challenge, and I know I don't have to say it to you, but I've said this over and over, uh, the, the folks in agencies uh, drive around most neighborhoods uh, in Los Angeles, and you're going to see people uh, who used to be one paycheck away and now fell three, four, five paychecks behind. Uh, and that's on one level. And the second thing we've been really focused on, which I'm extremely um, grateful for the team that we have, is we immediately put together a, a, a serious operation for constituent casework. Uh, and I will tell you for the first couple of months uh, that this happened, we were receiving about two, 300 calls uh, a day, basically around uh, two to three things, but more than more, was focused on two things. One was unemployment benefits, and two, the inability to pay rent. Uh, because obviously, if you're not if you're not working, that was the biggest issue. Uh, and then the the other was healthcare. Uh, but the two first ones were the most significant amount of calls, two to three hundred. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, we've also put in our district, and you may have seen uh, uh, or heard um, a robust operation. Uh, to allow uh, basic grocery um, uh, grocery bags uh, to residents. I mean, we, we're working with nonprofits now where we open up at seven in the morning to give grocery bags and people are lined up uh, at midnight uh, for a grocery bag. I mean, it is that bad out there that if you start taking a look, uh, we've got some programs in the Bull Heights area uh, where we're doing three or 4,000 people a day, I'm sorry, a week. Uh, we have seniors who we're delivering food to who can't leave their house because they're in vulnerable populations. Uh, so we're, uh, we're pushing hard to try to both help at the charitable hands-on level at the constituent casework piece, and then still keeping our foot on the pedal on those things uh, that we know will be a, a, a bigger challenge down the line if we don't address them now. Uh, mainly what we've talked about is, is tackling the issue of homelessness. Um, so I'm gonna drop it there. I know I went a little bit longer than I thought, but I thought it would be important to at least share all the little details as it relates to the budget and issue that's very important to you and, and, and me, which is the, the issue of homelessness. Well, Assemblymember, thank you very much uh, for the time um, and the hard work that you and your staff are accomplishing um, in Sacramento. We know, you know, the, the current climate requires a fast but thorough response. Um, and I thank you for your leadership. I do hope that you have another five minutes or so um, to give us for some Q&A. Um, sure. And so if you do have a question, uh, just raise your hand or if you're on, a, uh, on audio only, um, unmute yourself. I'll see that you are unmuted and I will call on you. Um, so we'll go Paul Keller and then we'll uh, go Tom and then Amara. Go ahead, uh, Paul. Good morning, Assemblyman. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. I just have two, I'm primarily in the real estate investment business and lending business nationally. Um, but the first question I would have is, is it still too early to assume that um, the entire rainy day asset on the balance sheet is gone? Is it like gone forever and we're gonna to have to start over again? Or has there been any way of structuring 
um, a budget that maintains some of it, or is that a complete wipeout? Well, look, I'll give you the short answer is, 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 and I know it may be frustrating to people, but I want to be as candid and honest as I possibly can. The reality is we don't know until we get the numbers in, in July 15th. Okay. The second no question. Okay. The second question is just, uh, I think for a lot of us who are having to do a lot of planning um, sure. operationally and financial planning around COVID, I think a lot of us are sort of waiting until hopefully Labor Day because hope we're hoping there'll be a lot more data available. We'll have a better understanding of possible treatments and perhaps a vaccine in the second half of next year. Um, when would you anticipate us seeing any, um, any of these impacts in this budget that you just spoke of relative to the homelessness population in the CBD? Sure. Well, well here, here's the thing, right? And and I, I count you guys in as allies uh, on helping to address the issue of yes. homelessness because you care very much about it. And it's an issue that's been important to me, right? Um, we release the dollars. The municipalities have to move. And, and they have been, if you saw this year, at neck break pace. The, the, the challenge that they're going to face and we're going to face all collectively is that the numbers continue to increase. And, and the numbers that we recently saw, the 12 and 14% respective, doesn't include the, the COVID numbers. So there is, uh, there is a significant amount of work being done. And you, you guys see the numbers, right? 15,000 in the LA area will get housed. But the challenge has been the, the amount of people that continue to land on the street. Now, that, that, that's the big picture piece of it. Uh, the results, I would say, have to, have to be done immediately. Uh, um, and, and I know that this summer, there is a significant um, number of permit supported housing that will come online. So we'll see an immediate um, relief in terms of people being able to have shelter over their head. Uh, and I use the word relief loosely to say, helping people to get shelter. Uh, the dollars that we have released, like for example, the 41 million that are being used at the time, uh, the half dollars, here's what was lost during the time. The state also in about May or April released all the half dollars. Uh, there's a number of dollars that, we, that, that we've structured over the years. HEAP was the Governor Brown's dollars, and I played, a, and your mayor played a, a very significant role in getting those dollars. Half dollars have been just released. Uh, the locals have also gotten federal dollars that they can use uh, for um, COVID-related um, items. So, so there's flexible uses for that. When the when the budget gets signed, they'll they'll be those dollars will be released pretty pretty quickly. So, so the short answer is the dollars will be released. Now we just got to work with the locals to push hard so they continue that sort of, that's a long way of saying, continue that sort of pace uh, to house folks. I mean, that's the bottom line. And I think we would all agree, we want them to continue at the pace uh, that they were. And, and, and rest assured that the numbers are showing up in terms of people being um, helped. Uh, the challenges is that more people are, more people are unable uh, to remain in their homes. And that's been the biggest challenge really. Sorry, I was muted. Um, all right, thanks. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Tom for his question, and then Amara, you're on deck. I would just uh, say that uh, the Assemblyman mentioned the food distribution program, and part of that's occurring in South Park. For those of you who don't know, uh, Lee on his um, uh, complex over there, the taxi cabs pull in on Tuesday and Thursday, and apparently there's a, a kitchen maybe you associate with the Marriott that produces these, this food, and it's boxed and, and sent out in mass to elderly. So, I mean, it's a little shout out to Lee and a shout out to South Park. Um, it, it would seem to me on the homelessness question that why are it seems like the simplest thing to do immediately would be rent subsidies, which helps the people who are behind on their rent payments. And it also helps the landlord and it keeps the money moving through the economy. So, you know, 
I don't, Assemblyman, I don't know the details of this, but it seems like that would be a kind of efficient and immediate thing that could be done to, you know, um, mitigate the problem. Well, there's some effort on that. Keep in mind, uh, I, I think your local municipalities are doing that. Keep in mind that we mentioned the flexible uses of dollars uh, would allow for some of that as I read it and others read it uh, when they're sent down. What the locals do with it, it would completely depend on, on their decision. We, we can't structure, we, there's certain guidelines to structure dollars and our structure that way. But you know, I, I also wanna caveat what you said um, with acknowledging that there is a serious limitation of dollars. If all federal funds don't come through um, the way we expect them, and if certain numbers don't hold uh, by July 15th, uh, and I want to be as candid as possible, I don't, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent what I think could potentially happen. We're optimistic, nonetheless. But let's say federal funds don't come through, and let's say let's say the numbers are devastating July 15th. Uh, they don't look like it, but let's say everybody's wrong. Um, I mean, we we could potentially be feeling a 54 billion dollar deficit. And, it, and, and all good ideas, um, mine included, uh, require a significant amount of funding that just may not exist. So we'll all be uh, sort of sitting tight until July 15 to see what those numbers tell us, because it really does uh, have a, a pretty big impact on the future. Um, Amara, and then we have time for one more after that, which is Bob, um, but take it away, Amara. Thank you, and thank you to the assembly member. Um, one of the things I do is manage a private fund of about a quarter of a million dollars in homelessness prevention. So I cannot emphasize enough um, how great it is to have those flexible use funds. Um, but I have two questions. And one is on the 600 million for Project Room Key, are those, will that be for discretionary use? Um, and do, if, you, if you know the answer to that, like for example, could that be used to purchase some of the properties that have been used to house people um, as a permanent, as a more permanent or interim uh, bridge housing solution? And then my second question is around affordable housing. And it, if you're familiar with Senate Bill, I believe it's 899 for churches to be able to build um, affordable housing on their properties. It's a zoning, um, sort of a zoning overlay or zoning change. The first answer, the, the first question about uh, about buying properties, I believe they could. Um, I would have to go back and fact check that, uh, but I believe there's some flexible use because the, the, that's when you saw, uh, it's the same project room key dollars um, that were talked about very early on. In the early versions of this, and the bill will be in print if it isn't already in the morning so I can go back and tooth comb it to make sure that my answer is accurate. But, but it's the same, the same way the governor had structured them in the past where he talked about potentially buying uh, hotels or motels. So, so the short answer of it uh, is potentially could. The question is, would it be cost effective? So I believe it could, um, but I'd have to go back and, and fact check. Uh, for, uh, keep in mind that any federal uh, regulations that, uh, that were tied to the dollars because, they, because when we started this, Project Room Key was state funds. Uh, when the feds delivered its 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 first allocation to the states, granted we had a because we had a fifty four billion dollar deficit, uh, some of these programs got backfilled uh, by federal dollars, and so we're now we have to adhere to federal regulations in terms of how you spend these dollars. And there's some timelines too, like I, I believe I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, but I think it's the end of December, uh, which into which those dollars are eligible uh, to be spent. So, so, so we've got to come back and figure out the rest of the, the fiscal year uh, when it comes out. That's why the dollars are structured very differently. Um, and, and you'll hear a lot about that. And, and look, in all fairness, they may change um, if we have to go back through budget trailer bills in, in July. So a lot of this stuff is very fluid based on, based on some assumptions and what we know today. Um, the second question is, no, I have not read the bill. I do know about it. Uh, I do. Um, I'm not fine. Uh, 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 combed it, uh, and, and there's a really good reason why, and you'll hear this a lot from other folks in the legislature as well. Uh, as the Senate is going through its appropriation process, uh, there's no way anybody's going to sit down and read, uh, you know, 1,500 bills, 1,000 bills, 100 bills. You, you wait to see if it gets out of appropriations, and it may already have, and then when it comes to our hot house, that's when you start to take a look at the things that go before your desk. So 
The short answer is I know about it. I've not sat down to take a look at it. Okay, and final question uh, from Bob Bente. Go ahead, Bob. Simon, thank you for uh, for joining us today. It's been very. And please call me Miguel. Okay, Miguel. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. When I come calling you for help, I'll make certain I call you Miguel instead of the yeah, Simon. Absolutely. Okay, no problem. Um, the question I have is building permanent supportive housing, which is what 1010 does, and seeing the residents we have. Um, and knowing who's on the street, because my office is at the corner of Olympic and Hope, I, I have a feeling that unless the state gets serious or even starts to consider um, putting money into mental health hospitals, that we're, 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 not, we're, we're King Lear yelling at the wind on the heat. Um, is there any discussion now uh, in the California legislature with respect to allocating funds, which I know there aren't any, but at least getting the discussion started about um, going back to the systems we had in the 1960s and 70s and actually having hospitals, because many of these people on the street need to be institutionalized. Perfect, permanent supportive housing is very, very important and it works very well, but there's a lot of people on the streets that it's it's putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. I mean, the short answer is none that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, most of it, but, but for the institutionalizing folks conversation, I'm not aware of them. If, if, if there is a conversation, I, I apologize. It's just never hit my, uh, my door. Um, but, but, and there's good reason why. In terms of the mental health care dollars, we do fund that. Uh, we are not the providers of mental health care services. It, it, it's your counties, your continuum of cares. Uh, I think the LA region has what's called a, uh, uh, forgive me because I'm uh, fumbling on the name, but the access fund that's kind of like that regional collaborative. So you've got LASA, you've got a number of entities uh, that are already produce in terms of the mental health care piece. And then the state does fund it. Um, and I'll remind you, also, the voters in California passed what was called the millionaire's tax maybe a decade or two ago. It, it, it uh, fogs me when it did. Um, and those were all um, MSHA uh, dollars uh, that, that directly go to, to, local, um, uh, to your local counties, I believe. Uh, so, so those are being funded. Um, should there be more? Sure. Could there be more effective and efficient uses? Absolutely. Now, but, but in terms of in terms of the immediate, I, I do believe that in a lot of cases, permanent supportive housing uh, would address some of those some of those issues because oftentimes uh, people who who have challenges before them who've been living on the streets um, haven't had the opportunity, uh, uh, such as whether they have whether they have uh, substance abuse or they have uh, mental health care issues or, or medical needs the, uh, or health care concerns. Um, that they have never been given the opportunity to see if it works or not. So, so, so that's one. The conversations that I have been involved in um, have been changes around the Latterman Act. And I've been very vocal uh, about that and, and what it means to change uh, the conservatorship uh, laws. Um, very controversial in Sacramento. I've been at this for about three, four years, but like with anything changing anything uh, that is significant, it's gonna take a lot of, a lot of controversy in terms of what it means. And, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, the Latterman Act was, was uh, passed uh, three or four decades ago that said uh, you couldn't take somebody against uh, their own will. And I'm giving you the 101 very high level version of it uh, against their own will uh, that they would have to consent. And so let's say, for example, um, somebody was on the, w w had uh, challenges and they were on the street, living on the street, um, and you wanted to conserve them and, to, and give them treatment, uh, the judge would not allow it to if that person was able to show that they could house themselves, feed themselves, or clothe themselves. And it's a pretty high cruel standard because uh, it's very difficult to actually bring somebody in and try to provide them the help uh, because they can do those things. Even if, even if you and I disagree that they couldn't, the judge will say, no, they can. They're just not going to, you know? And so what I've always, what I've been working over the years to try to change it is, is to have a definition of clear medical necessity. And believe me, it's extremely controversial. 
Uh, in fact, the LA Times has written about it over and over uh, because we've always argued, and I think you might agree, uh, that clearly some people uh, on the streets need, need medical assistance. And it's not that we're trying to take them against their own will, but we have an obligation uh, to be humane and give them the medical assistance they may need, even if at the moment uh, they might not agree with it. And so if you change the definition of conservatorship, which again, it's extremely controversial to say they got to, you know, if they're not able to feed themselves, clothe themselves, uh, or, or, or uh, what do they say, shelter themselves, or um, if they have medical necessity, that, then, then we can conserve them. Uh, and there's stories and witnesses that we have brought up to speak in Sacramento where, where mothers uh, have been trying to bring in their, their, one of their, their, their childs uh, who has had um, mental health care issues have been on the street, basically gashed their eyes. And this is a true story, by the way, I'm not making this up because we, this, this lady in Northern California has witnessed for, for my bills over and over. Uh, and there is no legal tool for her to bring in her child uh, mm-hmm. that exists in the state of California. And she's been one of the strongest advocates that we've had in trying to convince our colleagues that, yeah, sometimes we're not try- we need to change the law and bring somebody in, even if they don't want to, uh, be- because there's a greater good and that's giving the person uh, the-, the-, the help that they need at the time. So that conversation, that piece of it is happening. Good. Thank you, Assemblyman. We appreciate that response. And as you said, I think we're all very aware that it is a highly controversial, but also much needed um, discussion topic. Um, I do believe that there is a pilot happening um, with DMH in LA County um, that addresses a more holistic care model um, than simply permanent supportive housing and or, you know, there, there's sort of this, this range of um, intervention, one being institutionalization, which I think, you know, failed in such a miserable way um, that folks are quite apprehensive about diving back into that world. But um, there are uh, uh, alternatives. And I think that that is being explored. Um, I'll try to check in and see where that pilot is. But um, Thank you again for spending so much time with us. Uh, I know your your schedule is pretty packed. Um, and so we do appreciate you taking the time and addressing our group. Uh, thank you so thank much. You. If folks have other um, follow-up questions for uh, the assemblyman, then we can help facilitate that with, uh, with him and his staff. So just reach out to me and I will make sure that that happens. Thank you. But thanks so much, take care. Thank you, you too, so bye-bye. Much. Be safe folks. Lizeth and Mark as well for making that happen and being on. Thank you. Shout out to Wallace. (laughs) Yes, shout out to Wallace. Wallace rocks. (laughs) Okay, I'm gonna move us along and um, we do have just over an hour to get through the rest of our items. Um, So this will be sort of rapid where it can be. Um, Bob, we've got your update uh, on the agenda Next, so if you, I'll go with item B under treasurer update. It's the 2021 county assessment roll. This is just an FYI to the board that that has been submitted per the board's decision not to increase um, assessment uh, uh, assessments for 2021. We have submitted that um, database to the city who will then pass it to the county um, waiting back for final approval on that. But um, that's an FYI. And so the total dollar amount for 2021 is $2,942,050. Um, and again, that's just that's just an FYI for the board. Bob, uh, item A, April and May financials, if you want to review those for sure. the board. Sure. Uh, I'll only address May since that's the most current. Um, call your attention to total revenue and growth Profit, that's not really profit, but gross revenue, we are 34% ahead and a budget and that's $413,000. So that's good news. Even better news to me is that we are operating on the expense side so efficiently that we're $53,000 under budget, which is 4.4%. So all in all, that gives us, um, well, this is mid-month. This is mid fiscal year, so everything's going to start 
the, the advantages that I see in the um, operating in on the income statement are going to slowly be chipped away as more expenses incur and cash doesn't come in as fast. But I think we are in very good shape right now. Any and questions for Bob or me regarding the budget or the um, treasurer update? Okay, um, Bob, any other comments? I feel like I just cut you off. No, no, I, no. I'm trying to make up for time. Okay, uh, thanks. We'll move on to item number six. Um, so we're gonna actually get into a little bit more of our, the bid's response to COVID um, and where the city is at in terms of the reopening, <clears throat> but we are in stage three, um, which means as I'm sure you've seen around the city, some folks are, um, some business owners are opening back up um, as fully as they are able to at this point, which is still greatly reduced in terms of, um, you know, interior seating uh, arrangements, et cetera. But, um, you know, masks, it, it was announced a couple weeks ago now that masks are required when you are out in public space. Um, I think for the most part, downtown seems to be complying. Folks in downtown seem to be complying with that. Um, I know just from my own experience that elsewhere in the city, uh, it's not the same. There's little to no enforcement. Um, so, you know, it's, it's more of a friendly reminder and education, which I know our ambassadors are doing when they're out in the field. Um, but again, we will get into the bids response to COVID um, impacts in item number eight. B. So um, with that, I am going to open us up, unless actually Lee, are you still on? Yes, you are. Um, I know you are sort of right in the thick of reopening from a from the vantage point of a um, venue. And so if you do have an update that you feel comfortable sharing with the board, um, now would be the time to do that. Well, I think we all know that LA County Public Board of Health has allowed sports venues to open up and be fanless. Um, that said, in order to host a fanless event, you need a partner, um, i.e. in our situation, uh, the NBA, the NHL, um, or a award show promoter or a concert promoter for that, for that sense. We are, I can share with you that we are working with um, a boxing promoter to bring back um, a series of fanless events at Microsoft Theater that would begin latter part of July um, through August. And we are working with the Emmys to determine if um, they are either going to go virtual or they're going to try to put some type of uh, show emanating out of the Microsoft Theater that would be a broadcast related show um, without fans uh, in September. As it relates to Staples Center, you know, we wait like the rest of the industry waits for the NHL and the NBA to a determine when they're exactly going to start their 1920 seasons and finish those. Um, I'm sure most of you understand or are aware of the fact that um, they're looking to, for the NBA's case, go to Orlando and Disney world. Um, there are continue to be challenges with Orlando as it relates to cases going up. There continues to be challenges within the players association as to who wants to really go. So until I see somebody take a court or take the ice or take the field for that matter for baseball and football and, and MLS, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, we are still in contention to be one of the hub cities for the NHL to complete their season. Um, there are six cities left. Um, I do not hold my breath that Los Angeles is going to be one of those cities that is selected. Um, if we were to be selected, it would bring 41 days of training and events at Staples Center in and around LA Live. Um, that said, I do believe that Vegas is a front runner and they're looking to go to a Canadian city. So we're in stage three right now. Um, stage four means that we would be allowed to host events um, with fans moving forward. That brings its own challenges because um, we don't have any clear indication from the state, the city, or the county as it relates to any kind of relaxed restrictions on capacities. Would it be 20%, 30%, 40%, or 100%? Um, and 100% would be dependent on some kind of drug therapy, uh, herd immunity, or, or a vaccine. So it's like Groundhog Day. You know, every day you wake up with the same shit, and then you read about, you know, 
25 states are going up because they potentially have reopened too soon. You read about all the leagues that are getting ready to start and they've struck their deals. And until I see something happen, you know, like I said, I'll believe it when I see it. And then once they do open up, there will be challenges as it relates to um, what other cities are going to allow in terms of mass gatherings in their states as it relates to California. We all know where we are. Um, Texas, for instance, 50% in some outdoor stadiums now. Other uh, states are anywhere from 25 to 45 to 65%. So it's kind of like, you know, if you look at this worldwide, you see some countries opening up more. In my opinion, this is just my opinion, you know, the United States is really 50 different countries and um, we're all under our own our own protocols, our own guidelines from the state, the city, and the county. So we continue to do what we can to help the state, to help the city, and to help the county. Um, from an LA Live standpoint, four of our restaurants are now open, um, even though um, there are uh, uh, guidelines that allow restaurants to open up as 60% capacity. We have the Yard House, um, Starbucks, Patsy's Pizza, and Fleming's that are opened up at 60% capacity. But um, I can tell you without any major events taking place at LA Live, um, it's going to be tough for those restaurants to A, compete with other restaurants in South Park and downtown LA and to get employees to come back. Uh, you know, employees right now that have been furloughed or laid off in restaurants and the hotel industry, you know, they're in the middle of the $600 stipend through July. Who knows if that will be extended um, they're making more in unemployment and the stipend as they would if they came back to work at a restaurant and um, they're safe as it relates to their health. So there's a lot of moving pieces every day. There are more moving pieces and it just depends on who you want to believe, who you want to talk to. And I could probably talk for speculation on speculation for hours as to what I think is going to happen. But I will tell you that, that I do not see us getting to stage four in California until probably after the first of the year. Um, sometime in the first quarter, unless magically or miraculously, uh, or miraculously a, a vaccine appears. And then, you know, once a vaccine does appear, it opens up the other can of worms of, all right, who gets it? You know, what country is prioritized? Who's prioritized in that country? You already have countries that are vying for um, vaccines now and putting bids in for doses. And then you deal with, all right, who in that country is going to get it first? So, there are just a shitload of things that need to take place, I think, in just my opinion, before we get to any kind of normalcy. I don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer, but I am a realistic optimist. But I think that's where I see it from 20,000 feet above. Well, thanks, Lee. You definitely have the uh, perspective, a unique perspective on this reopening, given that your entire world uh, previously was based on, you know, live events, right? So um, yours is sort of the last frontier in terms of reopening. And so I appreciate uh, your willingness to share. Um, I'm, I'm gonna move on now to item number seven. Um, board members received in your packets um, a memo that I wrote um, regarding the recent protests, uh, the catalysts of um, uh, of those protests being the killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Um, this is a topic that um, has swept the globe. I mean, there have been protests overseas in um, countries like Japan and France, um, where folks in those countries are chanting the names of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Obviously, uh, Los Angeles has seen quite a fair share of um, protests, both peaceful and with um, vandalism and looting involved. Um, but all of that is to say that, you know, this is, a, there is quite a bit of momentum and energy around an issue that has been around um, for centuries. And that is the issue of um, equity and justice and the fact that those um, two very important values are not equally distributed in, in our country. Um, and Los Angeles is no exception to that. Every industry, um, many companies in across sectors, you know, are, I'm sure you've seen, making statements with regard to their stance or their solidarity or 
um, their commitments to what they are going to do. Um, you know, uh, these are these are companies as small as hair salons and as large as YWCA and Twitter. <laughs> um, but you know, we as a business improvement district are squarely in the world of public safety, and so um, the issues that we are talking about are are huge, right? But one sort of central point to them is. Um, the the racial biases that we see in um, our judicial systems and our law enforcement and as an organization that provides um, on the ground services um, for security for our district we very much have a voice at this table and um, we as an organization along with um, our fellow bids around the world um, are having these conversations about what our what is our role and what are appropriate action items that we can take now obviously these these issues are really sensitive and require a lot of conversation uh, i can't make the assumption that the board shares my values right and also my values don't really factor in, these are conversations that board members really need to be having amongst yourselves um, in a public setting. And I don't expect that this conversation, item number seven, is going to get us to a point where we are ready to take action and we are ready to identify um, you know, what our role is. What I do expect though is that this group comes together and understands and acknowledges um, that we do have a role and we do have a responsibility to identify what that role is. Um, and so I want to open it up. This is an open discussion item on the agenda. Um, I know that there are uh, folks who I've spoken to over the last several weeks who have um, comments that they wanna make and I welcome um, you to make those comments in this forum. Um, actually, Bob, I see your, your hand uh, went up, so I'm going to call on you to um, share your thoughts. Um, uh, trust me, I'll, anytime you give me the opportunity to speak, I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. I think we need to evaluate the the objectives here and the appropriateness of what we're trying to do. Um, there is a lot of Me Tooism right now going on. I mean, if one company does it, then all the other companies in that industry group feel they have to do it, so they're keeping up with the other company. We don't quite have that in, in bid. Um, I think we need to, to somehow study this. Uh, I, I'm not trying to pass off um, um, an end product or, or a decision, but I just don't think we know enough right now as to what the issue and the issues are. Um, we can all say that uh, we're not racist. We can all say that we feel equal opportunity is, is critical, um, but how do we actually put that into words that will mean something to our varied um, clientele, our customers, the, uh, the bid residents and the bid um, business. I'm done. Am I up? You are, yes. Okay. So, uh, Ellen, I showed Deborah the letter this morning before we headed on our walk. And so I got to listen to her for the next hour and a half. Um, so there's a lot of deep feeling about this. I mean, this is, um, you know, you, you guys chastised me for going back to my Missouri background, but Ferguson was about three miles from our home. And so, we have, uh, we have some experience with this. I guess I would pick up on Bob's comment. I, 
I think this might be an opportunity to pick up on some things we've done in the past, and that is um, one of the Saturday morning sessions was on um, community engagement. And we talked about what that looks like and how we can make that happen and what the bid, what's the bid's role. So this could be an opportunity if we got a diverse group of residents and businesses to, you know, I don't want to study something to death, but at least to uh, spread the knowledge and spread the concern and uh, seek, seek input from others. I mean, how many African-American people do we have on this call? You know? Yeah, um, very Yes. So, um, I mean, I have a, we have an African American friend in our building and we're trying to get him on the call for Saturday, you know, and I don't know if that will happen, but, but, it, um, yes, I'm, I'm very concerned about this. Um, I've been concerned about it since high school, which is 60 years ago, you know, um, and we need to do something. And I think to be effective, and Ellen, I, you've got to guide us on this. I think it's most effective if the other bids are involved. If we kind of reach a consensus and a combined strategy of, uh, of moving forward. And I don't know the politics of that at all. I have no idea how you deal with the other bids, but it would seem best if we're able to uh, form a coalition to address this. Well, I will say that um, the South Park bid is a member of the International Downtown Association, which is sort of the membership organization for business improvement districts and um, similar organizations around the world. And I, and this is a topic that is very much in the spotlight for uh, them. In fact, on Monday morning, I was on a panel about race and equality in our industry and how we are approaching this issue. Um, there were over 100 people on that call. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what yet is going to come out of that work um, and those conversations, but I do know that the industry is certainly tuned in. Um, and so whether that means that the other bids in LA are, you know, uh, going to heed the leadership of IDA, you know, that's yet to be determined, but, but I hear you as much as the industry can kind of come together and say, this is our lane, but here's how we can make a, an impact, a positive impact, you know, we will certainly I will bring that information to this board when it when it is available. Ellen? Yes, Terry. Um, is it feasible or possible for us to put together a subcommittee with residents in the community that are um, are either African American or of other cultures? Because I think your point and Tom's point, it's really important. All of us sitting on this board, many of us, we we weren't raised to understand racism on ourselves. We, we never felt what African-Americans or Asians or other people may be feeling. And I think it's really important that we don't set things that we think are right without getting the involvement of those that actually have felt these things and understand and understand that it's an educational issue and an ignorance issue, not necessarily always a racist issue but it's really important that we, as majority white people sitting around this table, don't put things out that say, this is how we think it should be done. It's not right. And that's, yeah, you know, I, that's my really personal opinion. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that sentiment. Um, I'm a little hesitant to uh, require or ask people yeah. of color to do that work for us, but but I but I hear what you're saying, and so um, to the extent that we can listen and learn and um, approach 
people who are who are willing to participate absolutely um but you know a lot of what i am reading uh, articles about how to be a leader or how to lead staff during this time you know rule number one is like don't ask your black colleagues what you should be doing you know you got to do that work on your own but but yes i hear i hear you and i share that sentiment and but so i do think there's a way to achieve that um absolutely we just don't want to be tone deaf i guess is at yes. the end of the day yeah absolutely um but this idea of forming a, a task force and um you know using that platform to a have these conversations um with each other b plot out our plan, you know, how are we going to arrive? Tom, you, you mentioned, you know, I don't want to study something to death and neither do I, frankly, I, I, I'm a person who is focused on action. Um, and I think that this board is too. Uh, and so I don't want to spin wheels if nothing is going to come out of it. Um, but I do think that we need to educate ourselves and, and spend some time listening and learning um, before we can identify what those actions are. Paul Keller, yeah, I see you. Yeah, I just um, <clears throat> wanted to say, really, stepping back from all of this and reflecting on the whole issue of systemic inequality, I would urge, and, and thinking about learning and educating, um, I would urge everyone on this call to YouTube an incredibly eloquent uh, statement Brian Gumbel has just recently made about the black tax. And as an African American, what it's been like to go through, he's 72, I, I had forgotten, the guy's, he's 72 years old, and you'll probably see when you see him on YouTube, he, uh, he definitely looks, doesn't look like the Brian Gumbel we all grew up with. But in any event, he gives such a succinct, eloquent description of growing up in the US, in you know, achieving the success and the wealth that he's achieved, and talking about the black tax. I would just urge everybody to watch it. Thanks, Paul. I, that's um. I love that we're at a point where we're talking about resource sharing and specific um, specific resources that we should be looking into. I will send that link and a couple of other reading materials that I've um, come across that I've found really helpful out to the group. Uh, in terms of moving forward, I mean, I want to continue to open up this conversation. So I, you know, forget that I just said in terms of moving forward. Um, Dave Gordon, I think I saw a hand a while back. If you still want to make a comment, yeah, I do. Thanks, Alan. Um, I, I think it's an incredibly important topic, um, an issue for us to at least begin discussing and addressing. Um, in particular, given our location, you know, being in the middle of downtown LA, and the fact that we have a melting pot demographic of you know of every type of person you can imagine within our boundaries. It's incredibly important. And you know, given the, the resources that we could provide to minority and women-owned businesses to come into the area, um, you know, I, I think is one area that we could start to think through how we can address to promote uh, because you know, just thinking about um, you know, those on, on the board, I know it's you know, a lot of developers, a lot of, um, a lot of residents, but trying to get you know more potentially business owners and especially minority business owners to to provide their voice to um, you know to what we're doing, I think is an important piece as well. Absolutely. Any other thoughts from board members um, or ideas about how to move forward? I have some of my own, but I. Uh, would love to hear some ideas from board members. Ellen, what's what's the agenda for the Saturday thing? So Saturday we have a, uh, it's our discussion series. We've been doing these for over a year now. Um, we've done them in the past, um, discussion on public safety, dis discussion on mental health during a safer at home ordinance. 
um, discussion on homelessness. Um, and so this Saturday, we're doing a discussion on race and racism. <clears throat> and it's an open forum. This is a community event. So historically, they've been aimed at residents in the district. It's been a way for us to get to know each other, but also talk about um, sometimes controversial issues and provide that space. The agenda is similar, Tom. We'll be sh we've shared some articles um, that we've been reading, and we're hopeful that we can convene a group of people on Saturday um, who are interested in having a hard conversation about uh, what their what their experiences have been, but also how to break out of your own mental map and ex you know pers perspective of the world. Um, and recognize that everybody does not have the same experience and how can we even out that playing field? What, what we can be doing to even out that playing field a little bit? Well, I, I think we need to pay attention who participates because that might be the source of some folks that might want to pursue this further. Yes, absolutely. I think um, one of the things I've been thinking about you know, uh, uh, with regard to this topic is, you know, there's sort of like two um, lanes. One is an internal examination of the organization, staff, board, our vendor uh, contracts, et cetera. Are we walking the walk? Um, and then two is our programming and our external influence and what levers we can play with to have some influence. Um, and, uh, board elections are coming up. We last year decided to implement term limits. Um, so we're going to start seeing new faces on our board. And historically, we really haven't done a whole lot of, um, board development or outreach to solicit applications. It's really been an opt-in. And what we've seen is that folks who have more free time, um, you know, maybe folks who are retired um, or who have more of a cushion in terms of income. Don't um, get personal. None, none of this is, per well, actually all of it is personal. <laughs> and that's what makes these conversations kind of hard, right? But um, they're the ones that show up and that's not, bad. That doesn't mean that their voices are not valid. It just means that we, it, unless we solicit and really do a, a, a better job of, um, you know, asking folks to be engaged or reaching out to people who are not opting in already, we're going to see the same faces over and over again. So there's a, so yes, let's pay attention to who self-selects into this group, but let's also pay attention to who's not in the room. Um, and who we need to do a better job of reaching out to. I agree, and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> I know we will. Okay, um, so I did include an action item on this agenda because if I don't, the board is not allowed to take an action or to take a vote on anything. That doesn't mean, just because it's there doesn't mean you have to use it. Um, my recommendation was a commitment to education. It sounds like this board is very interested in doing that. I think sort of the process by which that education happens is important to pay attention to. Um, Terry, you brought up this idea of forming an, uh, a task force or an ad hoc committee. Um, I do like that idea. Ultimately, whatever actions uh, are decided on have to be decided on by the entire board. But um, what we've done in the past with ad hoc committees is um, the real work happens in that committee and then that the committee takes those findings and those recommendations to the full board um, for adoption or approval. Is that a model that the board feels comfortable pursuing with regard to this topic? Are there other ideas with how uh, about how we might approach this? Okay. Um, <laughs> do does anyone feel like they want to make a motion to uh, form a task force committee? 
Ellen, do you think that maybe we wait until after the 27th and see how that that discussion goes? It may open up some ideas. Um, well, if the whole board wants to participate in that discussion, sure. But I'm not sure that's sort of a community event. And this is about what the organization is willing to do um, or going to do and figuring that out. So this is a working group, right? This isn't Understand. Uh, with goals and stuff. I mean, I would love for the for every board member to attend the event on the 27th. Um, I think we've done, you know, there, there are ways in which staff has found um, spaces for us to have conversations about some of these issues. And we've done that in the past. Unfortunately, those have been sort of community facing and um, not board facing necessarily. So, um, you know, this is slightly different, I think. Okay. I just think if the board, it sounds like, and through conversations that we've all had, that I've had with you offline, it sounds like the board is serious about this. We just need to determine what that looks like. Terry Rubin I saw your hand. Yeah, um, I do think it's something that the board needs to address, but I think that our main interaction with the public goes through block by block, and I'd be interested to know if block by block has done anything in response to this. Yeah, I shared um, a statement that was issued by the CEO of Block by Block with the board. I'm happy to reshare that. Um, I think that that, you bring up a good point, right? That is our interaction with the public, but the issue of equity and justice and systemic racism goes far beyond interpersonal mm -hmm. action, um, interpersonal um, communication, right? It's, it's not just a racist act or a biased act um, or implicit biases, right? It is access to education, access to healthcare, access to job opportunities. What are the demographics of our district? Why do we see a median household income of $160,000? You know, um, huge issues that the bid may or may not have influence on, but I think, you know, to Bob's earlier point is like, we need to have a conversation about what the scope is of what we are trying to accomplish here. Yes, it is. It, it does include our vendor and how ambassadors are being trained, um, you know, implicit bias training, all of that. But it's also what kind of programming are we doing it? Are we doing and where are we doing it? What kind of um, development projects are we strongly advocating for and what, what kind are we not? Why are we only seeing a particular type of development project being uh, introduced into our district, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a piece of the puzzle for sure. Hi, Ellen, this is May. Do you know Faye's trying to reach Hi, us? May. Do you know Faye's trying to reach us? Uh, I yes, I, I, I received an email actually just now from Sunya. She says, Faye should be on, but I don't see Faye. Do you? Yeah, I see her number popping up. So I'm wondering whether she's trying to, you know, connect or what. I don't know why. I see her number popping up though. On the screen or? On, I can see it's her number. Oh, well, Faye, are you on? Hello? Maybe I'll text her. I'll text Hello. her. Okay. Ellen, did I uh, understand you correctly that what you're looking for right now is a motion um, and some affirmative action from the board to form some ad hoc committee to start hopefully coalescing around whether it's learning, educating, sharing, whatever th this issue is. Is that what you're looking for now? Yes. Okay. I mean, I'll make the motion. Second. That was Tom. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 
All right. Could you repeat the motion, please? I'm right. sorry. To form an ad hoc committee that'll report back to the board and, and the membership in general around this issue. Thank you. Uh, so do we have any um, opposition or abstention? Great. Thank you, Paul, for introducing that motion. Um, I will follow up with the board about the logistics of who will be on that in that meeting, whether it is um, board members only or if we are going to ask community members to also be a part of these conversations, perhaps not in a formal and um, permanent way, but you know, as, as guests to our meetings. Um, but we can dig in a little bit into what that's going to look like. I think this is a good start. Um, and I am uh, grateful and to have you, board members who want to dig in. And, and if you want to learn more about the black tax, I flipped everyone the link on here a moment ago, the YouTube link. Uh, and I would just urge everyone it's to, to watch it. It's, it's very, very, very heartfelt. And, and uh, he's a very, very smart guy. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. Ellen, right. Ellen this is yes. Tom. You know, um, I would urge uh, you and Wallace to be thinking through a communication strategy on how this motion is um, sent out to the, our constituents and what we ask them to do. Sure, so Tom, you know, I, I'm hesitant to make any statements without, without having sort of the outcomes of this ad hoc um, committee formalized. I'm not really a fan of, uh, you know, issuing statements without having something to back it up. I mean, what does that mean? So absolutely, once we start get once we get to a place where, okay, we've been meeting, this is what we're deciding, these are the programs we're pursuing. Um, I think then is when we start to uh, talk about the work that we're gonna do, if that makes sense. But again, I'm happy to have a conversation. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what you mean by a communication well, strategy about this motion. Well, you just described a strategy to me. So, um, you know, you guys are the experts and you know the community, but I, I think we need to uh, be in the posture of broadening the discussion as early as you think appropriate. Okay. All right, um, are there any other comments regarding uh, agenda item number seven? I am sad that Faye wasn't able to join us. She and I had a pretty riveting conversation yesterday, um, but perhaps she'd be willing to share some thoughts to the group via email. I'll follow up with her. Um, all right, if there aren't any other comments, I'm gonna move us on. Hello, Ellen. I, I'm I, sorry. I, yes, hi. I got a text from Sonia saying that Faye will call you after this uh, conference call. After the Zoom okay. meeting. Okay, sounds great, thank you. Okay, um, all right, let's move on then to item number eight. Um, I'm gonna report out one um, issue for infrastructure and planning committee, um, and that is the Olive Street repaving and bike lane improvement. Um, so during uh, the Safer at Home ordinance, the city, um, Streets LA, which is formerly known as BSS, uh, launched a project to resurface streets throughout the city that hadn't gotten um, resurfaced in, in some cases, several decades. They were sort of taking advantage of the um, absence of vehicular traffic and making improvements. So they identified Olive and actually Grand as well, but Olive is the one that has already happened to resurface. And um, that, that decision was made by, the, by Streets LA. DOT 
saw this as an opportunity to expand on some of their bicycle infrastructure. And so this was all very much an expedited um, process. Um, I got a phone call from DOT last or maybe two weeks ago now saying, um, hey, we're about to install bike lanes tomorrow. Wanted to give you a heads up. So uh, not an ideal situation by any means, but this is what's happening. And we have, you know, the downtown community sort of as a whole has advocated for multimodal transportation options. Um, this particular enhancement isn't removing any lanes of traffic. Um, there is an existing bike lane already on Olive. Um, and the improvements here are actually that it will now be a protected bike lane. Um, so from in our district, from Olympic to um, Pico, uh, the, that is the repaved street. They are not going south of Pico because there are some future development projects um, that are going to be happening um, in the near future and uh, you know you're not there's a there's a, an ordinance that says after a, a year after a street is repaved you cannot stripe so they're waiting for those development projects to you cannot restripe they're waiting for those development projects to happen before they repave the southern portion of olive all that is to say the changes that are going to happen are um Currently, the bike lane is on the east side of the street. They're going to be moving it to the west side of Olive. Um, there will be parallel parked cars. Um, so it'll go curb line, then the bike lane, and then parallel parked cars. Um, I do have some renderings. I can forward those emails. Um, the actual restriping, I believe, is going to be taking place next week. Um, all of the uh, property owners and business owners adjacent to those improvements have already been communicated with by DOT and by us. Um, so we are doing our best to kind of keep up with this really tight timeline. Again, Grand is also going to be seeing some improvements. Um, we don't know yet what the date of those, um, of, of those improvements is going to be, but I will communicate that when it happens. So this is more of an FYI than anything else. And I'm sorry that uh, we couldn't do anything to make sure that the process of outreach was um, thorough beforehand, but this was a really tight turnaround, as I said. Okay, Alan, I'm gonna... Yes. Alan, do we not have the, this is Daniel, do we not have the transitions going to occur at Pico with the existing bike lane being, I believe, on the right side? <laughs> I do, I have a rendering, Daniel, that I will send to you. Um, it is essentially a, a box waiting area for the, so northbound, um, still on the south side of Pico, there will be a waiting box. And then there will be a, you know, you cross on the south side of Pico, and then you cross again on the west side of Olive. But I'll share that image with you. I think it'll be clearer what I'm saying with the image. Thank you. Anything going on with the with the olive triangle? Um, yes, but I'll talk about that offline if you don't mind, just because it's not on our agenda. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Wallace for an update on district identity. Cool. Um, Ellen, can I share my screen, or would you rather share from yours? Um, I would love. I have some bad news, which is that my interface is frozen, so I may have to. Um, I'll share. <laughs> You're yeah. having a bandwidth. That's what it keeps saying under you, Ellen. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> good to know. It'd be cool if it told you that. Yeah, right. So I'm going to. Okay. Do you have the ability to do that? No, nope, I, I need to you to enable. Yeah, so I'm frozen, so I'm going to have to. You've been frozen for quite some time. Good. Yeah, but these uh, are all in our packets. We could we could all refer to our packets, right, Wallace? We're good. Um, I mean, the the deck isn't only oh, the, the deck isn't? um. I can I mean I can drop the Dropbox link into chat, or I can log in from my cell phone also as info and enable it for myself. 
Uh, Wallace, you know, a better solution would be to just switch users and you can do that. Um, it's like log in as different users. Okay. I can also try to log out and log back in. Sorry. For the technical oh, I see. Switch account. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Um, I've logged in, but I can't join without closing this window. So hopefully I can get back in. Give me a second. All right, there we go. Can everybody hear me? All right. Um, screen sharing is still disabled, Ellen. Wallace, you're right. It does say uh, the host disabled the attendee screen sharing. I know. And now I'm logged in as the host. So I and don't know. You, what if you hit OK? You should Nothing be happened. able to, if you go to the bottom, there should be a green, you know, the green icon that says share screen and you just click on it. Yeah, let's see. Um, there should okay. be a, a down, uh, yep. share on next to it. That should allow you to do it. Yeah, I think it's, there we go. There we go. Thank you, getting there. All right, after all of that. You did it. We're getting there, right? <laughs> Okay, and everybody can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. looks great. All right, so District Identity and Marketing Committee update. So first, um, we're gonna do a quick update on our communications response to COVID-19. Um, I'll keep it really fast. There's not a lot that's changed since our last board meeting. Um, just a quick reminder, we determined early on that our role in this was first to encourage the adoption of crucial public health method measures, and second, to support businesses and employees as they're impacted by these public health measures. So um, we have been making an effort to rely on experts to maintain two-way communication, especially with those businesses, um, and to stay factual, no fear mongering. So uh, the first thing we did was launch that COVID-19 resources guide. Um, the most recent update to that was this mental health resources page. So our last Saturday discussion series was specifically about mental health during Safer at Home. We had a little group of residents join us um, and talk about what is keeping them sane while they're trapped at home. Um, and we shared those resources along with, um, which ranged from easy things like taking a walk and suggestions to find a way to help um, to like online happiness courses that we've had people report that they're taking. And then we did a brief guided meditation exercise. So after that, we launched this mental health resources page um, our COVID-19 resources guide, including this page, is still the most viewed page on SouthPark.la. It's got 1,664 views to date. That's uh, gone down a little bit since the April board meeting. People were logging on 
um, pretty uh, frequently and quickly when this was new. Um, and then in the last 30 days, uh, views to our website are up by 14%. Uh, unique visitors, our visits are up 11% and page views are up just over 7%. So um, we're still feeling like this is an indicator that this is information people are finding useful. Um, and the feedback we're getting still indicates that. So um, if anybody has questions about that, uh, I will say ask me later just because we only have a few more minutes, um, 20 minutes till the board meeting is over. Um, and then our frequent e-blasts are continuing. So we almost doubled our e-blasts when uh, we started communicating about what was going on with coronavirus. Uh, we're not quite doubling at this point, um, just because the news has slowed down a little bit. Um, but COVID-19 news is still making up the bulk of our content. Uh, as coronavirus becomes something that we live with, as opposed to this like extreme event, um, we are talking a little bit more about regular city news, uh, kind of regular business has resumed some, um, obviously including information on businesses reopening. Um, and then protests and police, police reform news has become a little bit frequent. Um, there's uh, absolutely no way to talk about our roles without talking about LAPD. So uh, that's important news for people to be getting. Um, and the, the response has still been um, quite good to all of that. Uh, not a lot of individual comments, just uh, our, all of the reading indicators are still up. So um, we've also started doing almost daily notifications of planned protests. These are pretty simple, um, but over a thousand people are opening them on average. So uh, feeling like they're being used. Um, we are starting to notice if you see these total delivered numbers, that our average of delivered newsletters is dropping. Uh, that looks like it's pretty standard in terms of our unsubscribe rate, but unfortunately, a lot of people who were laid off at the beginning of coronavirus, um, uh, obviously their emails are no longer active. So we're getting a lot more bounces than is normal. Um, I don't think it's something we need to worry about in terms of our email list. Um, open rate is still quite high um, and click rate is still um, pretty high. These protest notifications are shooting that down a little bit because there's nothing to click on. But um, overall, feeling like we're providing the information people are finding useful. Does anyone have questions so far? Cool. Um, so we're going to talk about our virtual events and programming. Um, we have uh, really focused a lot on business support through COVID-19. So um, a few different ways. Um, right now, we've gone a little bit from supporting businesses as they figure out how to stay closed and some of those earlier uh, programs we were doing, like connecting uh, business owners who had questions with people who could answer them um, in terms of the support and the financial resources available uh, to supporting businesses as they modify their operations in order to reopen. So um, we did several online tutorials and events early on in this. We did a hand building demonstration with John from Throw Clay, an empanada folding class with Andrea from Barcito, a braid tutorial with Kimberly from Cut to the Feeling, and then we co-hosted a workout with Nine Round. Uh, as businesses are trying to reopen in uh, real life, they are we're not focusing as much on virtual events. Uh, reopening in and of itself is a pretty uh, time-consuming thing. So now we're moving into this kind of physical distancing support. So we printed these Keep South Park Safe, safe stencils. Um, and Tony specifically has been really busy connecting with business owners who tell us they want them and stenciling those in front of businesses uh, just over six feet apart. So that has been, um, I think, a really useful way for us to support businesses. We also printed a ton of the signage the mayor's office made um, that's like masks are required, that kind of stuff. Um, and our team is keeping them on hand as they do business contacts so that if they see somebody's open and doesn't have adequate signage, they can just hand one over. Um, we in the district identity committee talked a lot about the possibility of creating our own um, and ultimately felt like it was too expensive and too time consuming and the information was what was important. And so we just went ahead and printed a bunch of them errors and are dropping them off. Um, and these stencils uh, were unbelievably inexpensive compared to the cost of uh, stickers, which were like $30 a sticker, and our stencils were $23 each, and spray paint is $6. So um, saved a ton of money, got a lot of impact out of those. Um, and then we've also been working on systematizing our promotions. So Lulu has been helping out with this a ton. Uh, one of the biggest challenges when we talk to businesses about how we can help promote what they've got going on 
um, is that we get something different from everybody. And so sometimes uh, we are working with businesses who have a social media person or social media expertise, and they send us a bunch of beautiful professionally taken photos. Um, and sometimes we are working with iPhone 4 photos. So uh, we have made a big effort to standardize what we're asking people for. Um, and that has meant that it's much easier for us to get information out as businesses reopen. Um, it's a little bit, um, obviously there's a lot more going on right now. So rather than our usual, you know, one new business opened this month or something, um, we're working with, you know, nine new businesses opening in the same week. So um, that's enabled us to get a lot more information out really quickly. And let's see, Ellen, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Hi. I know you wanted to talk a little bit about um, I did. these protests. I just want to give an update. Um, it's not COVID related necessarily, but it is a way in which we are supporting businesses through this time. Um, so obviously, if you uh, have been in downtown recently, you've noticed a lot of boarded up um, ground floor businesses. Um, we had, just to give this group an overview, we had um, 18 windows in our district smashed during the protests. We had a bus shelter um, that had a glass wall um, that was smashed. We had five burnt out trash cans, um, two smashed ATMs, um, and pretty uh, prevalent graffiti throughout the district. Um, and, and that was sort of the the um, summary of, of the damage that uh, the district incurred. Um, compared to the rest of downtown, I think we didn't see a whole lot of activity or we didn't see the bulk of activity, that's for sure. Um, we've reached out to each of the businesses that had some vandalism, um, whether it was window smashed or graffiti, to make sure that they had the resources they needed um, to get you know, a quick turnaround in terms of repair and also to submit a, a LAPD report um, just so that we can track um, the, you know, the, the crime that we're seeing in the district um, and you know, what was protest related versus not. Um, are there any questions about that at all? I know Bob, you had requested that I mention that information. Okay, let's move on. All right, cool. All right, so our next kind of event and programming um, arena is community building. And so these are the things that have traditionally been like our uh, discussion series to a certain extent, but mainly like our Meet Your Neighbors event. Um, we are working on rethinking that and rethinking our virtual programming strategy to reflect the likelihood that we won't be doing in-person events, at least through the end of the year. So, um, you know, until it's safe, we're not going to do anything that puts our community at risk. So, um, two challenges here. The first is in reaching new residents. Um, we've had a few new people tune into virtual events who we'd never met before and then tune back in, which is exciting. Um, but for the most part, uh, people are joining Zoom events with people they know and organizations they're familiar with. So um, one of the challenges in reaching new residents is buildings without on-site building managers. Um, like we talked a little bit earlier, if we're gonna have a conversation about equity, um, part of that is uh, making sure we are reaching people who are not already in the room. And so um, some of the buildings that we have the hardest time um, getting in touch with and have frankly not done a good job of um, our buildings without on-site building managers. So Victor has been doing a lot of um, on foot work to get um, names and contact information for some of those buildings so that we can invite people um, who have frankly probably never been invited to a bid event before um, uh, just because we don't know them. Um, and so that's one big effort here. Uh, the next is collaborating with new buildings to reach new residents. Um, we're hopeful that we can kind of use Hope and a Flower as a uh, example of how we could do this. Um, but new buildings are uh, not gonna have the same, um, you know, resident who came to meet your neighbors the last three years in a row and had a really good time. So uh, that's a little bit of a challenge. Um, and then the third thing is in asking engaged residents to personally invite friends. So this is a little bit of a new tactic, but as we've been having events where, um, you know, the same people keep showing up and we're really glad to see their faces, 
um, personally asking them to just like, if they run into somebody in the elevator, ask them to join us. Or if they have the phone number of whoever lives across the hall, ask them to join us. Because uh, that personal invitation um, goes a long way, especially when you are not familiar with the organization hosting the event or not familiar with the events portion of that organization. Um, the next thing is avoiding virtual event fatigue. So at the beginning of coronavirus, we were all doing Zoom happy hours and Zoom game nights. Uh, and I think everybody's a little bit Zoomed out right now. Uh, and so we're working on building some programming that doesn't require people to congregate. So um, in district identity meetings before, we've thrown out the idea of like putting hopscotch on the ground. And maybe this is the ideal time to start looking at things like that, ways that we make the neighborhood um, engaging and interesting that don't require people to all be in the same place at the same time, whether that's in person or virtually. Um, and that's another example of kind of expanding from traditional virtual events to more passive programming. So things like um, scavenger hunts, things that people can kind of engage in on their own time without having to um, log in at 5 p.m. on the dot, uh, but still connect them with the neighborhood and still connect them with each other. Um, and then we're also ready for the reopening of South Park Commons. So this came up many times um, in Instagram direct messages, in comments on Facebook, uh, and we are excited to see that that's reopening. Ellen, did you have something specific you wanted to bring up there? I'm sorry? Did you have something specific you wanted to bring up there? I don't know what we can announce. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so for Commons is getting ready to reopen. We're really excited. Um, you'll hear more. Uh, that like Oops. real uh, well, public space. Yeah. Uh, this is Tom. What about the park at Venice and Hope? It's, it's been shut down as well. Yeah, um, that park is owned by the hospital. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why the closure, like how much of it is coronavirus and how much of it is that that car crashed into the front. So it's missing part of the fence right now. Um, Ellen, do you know what the repairs are like for that? They're done. They're, they're done? They repaired the fence? They've repaired the fence. It needs to be painted. Okay. So I'll see what we can find I, out. I believe Yes, I, the, I believe though that they are not willing to take on the liability of opening the park and not having a full-time uh, person there to help with social distancing. Um, so especially because it's sort of a, it's a contained offense park, obviously it's still open air and per the state, people are supposed to be wearing masks, um, but it's relatively small. So uh, I can reach back out and see what their plans are for revisiting that conversation. Um, I think we had Patrick and um, Susan yeah. on the call. Hi, Patrick. Yeah, Ellen, this is Patrick. Yeah, um, I, I can check and, and, uh, and see what the status is and get back to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, it, you know, if you think about it, it kind of relates to our earlier conversation about inclusiveness and reaching out to other cultures and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, if, if the park on 12th opens and the park surrounded by low income buildings doesn't open, that's like a pretty good point, Tom. Um, cool, so we will keep talking about that. Um, but for now, um, we do know that South Park Commons is reopening. And so maybe there's an opportunity also to make sure that information gets out to people who live in buildings without on-site building managers. Uh, and we'll keep talking about that in our next district identity meeting is coming up pretty soon where uh, both of these things, how we reach new residents and how we uh, kind of move from Zoom happy hours into something a little bit more sustainable uh, are both gonna be things we we're talking about. Um, all right. And finally, our education and dialogue. And I might wanna leave a few, a little, a little bit of time for questions, um, just because our discussion series came up a few times earlier. So we have held seven of these uh, Saturday morning breakfast discussions, um, and we wanna build on the success of our existing education and dialogue programming um, to make more space for discussion of growing challenges, right? Um, this event series started as a way for us to um, have real conversations about things that are facing South Park and other downtowns, and uh those changes are increasing and changing so are those challenges um we've adapted the discussion series to work online and i think that it's worked pretty well our attendance is comparable 
we averaged 22 RSVPs per event and about 11 attendees. Um, the one that is this Saturday, a discussion on race and racism in downtown has 45 RSVPs. So we're anticipating that being a little bit bigger than normal. Um, our last one, the mental health one, I think we had about nine people tune in, which was pretty standard. Um, and the discussion went pretty well. So uh, they do require us to uh, program the discussion a little bit more, have some prompts, have some conversation topics uh, to avoid just like Zoom overtalk. Um, but we're gonna keep working on adapting that series uh, to be online. We've moved up the frequency a little bit too. Uh, we decided to do them quarterly and we're putting them out every two months instead. Um, the other way that we're doing this is using them to build momentum for new initiatives. So uh, our recent discussion events, we've moved away from them being just an opportunity for people to talk and get to know what their neighbors think um, into a way to kind of build momentum for new initiatives and get an idea of what people are passionate about. Um, so when we did our sustainable cities discussion, um, obviously things like recycling have a pretty big impact on our operations. Uh, we have done a lot of research since then on how we could do things like a uh, composting program because that was something that continually came up during that event. And then second, the civic participation discussion which Tom brought up earlier. Um, we, we came out of that with a bunch of really great ideas for in-person initiatives and then coronavirus happened three weeks later. So uh, we're due to revisit what some of those look like in a virtual formatting. Um, but we'd like to continue using those at the very least as an opportunity to get an idea of what the community wants to see us working on or wants to see somebody working on and whether or not we're the appropriate people to be doing it. Um, and then also to see how we can uh, incorporate those opinions into our work better. Um, that's really it for me. Does anyone have questions or anything to add? Hey, Wallace, I know uh, at the last district identity meeting, we talked about the 501c3 and potentially putting that on hold for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, thinking about the days, you know, in the next hopefully a few months when we can all get back together and have a drink together, um, I think it would be great to kind of think, think about that point in the future and work our way backwards um, to look to how long it would actually take to get this 501c3 you know, ready to go and, and operational. Um, so it might be a good thing to kind of put that back on the list of priorities for the next uh, couple of months. Yeah, like what uh, what the timeline looks like so that when we see that things are moving forward, we know if and when to kind of kick that into the gear. Ellen? Yeah. I think it's, yeah, Dave, I hear you. Um, I, I think in the beginning of this whole thing, every it, it, we were very, reactionary and exactly. projects got put on pause and um but you know wallace made a comment early on that uh, you know this is now something that we are going to be living with um and so as much as we are able to get back to um normal business uh yeah let's let's try that so i hear you we'll add it back onto our list yeah thanks Dave. i just i just want to add uh a second to Dave's uh, comment. I think, uh, I mean, some of the legal work s seems to be able to occur in the background and maybe that could proceed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our, our rationale for putting it on pause uh, was largely that with things changing so much, it was hard to anticipate what the, especially at the beginning of this, to anticipate um, how the needs of the district might change in response to a pandemic and recession. And I think that we are um, starting to get a better idea of what our role will be through recovery. And so it's a good time to start talking about that again, or at least put a pin in it to make sure we're thinking about starting to talk about it again. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Thanks, Wallace. Cool. All right. So Thanks. We have a minute left. Um, upcoming events. Uh, FYI to infrastructure and planning committee members. Um, our last meeting uh, on the third was postponed because I'm still waiting for information from DOT on the final My Figueroa MOU. Believe it or not, that is still happening. Um, 
the draft that I'm waiting on should be the one that we are ready to sign. Jim Pugh um, gave a look on, on our behalf to make sure that, you know, we are agreeing to what we want to agree to and um, pending that draft, uh, and which I expect to come, well, I expected it to come pretty soon after the June 3rd um, meeting, but you know, we're still, we're still waiting on it. So as soon as I get that, I will schedule, um, that infrastructure and planning, uh, meeting. We've mentioned quite a few times now the discussion on race and racism, uh, this Saturday at 10 o'clock. I highly encourage board members to participate. Um, our resident board members are really good about, um, participating in resident focused events, but I think that the work that comes out of those um, is relevant to the rest of the board as well. So if you can um, add that to your calendar, we would love to see you there. District Identity is coming up on uh, the 8th. Um, and then our next infrastructure and planning meeting is August 5th, but I expect to be rescheduled before then. Um, and then a couple of other things that are on the horizon that I just want to share. We don't have, we're not gonna talk about them, but keep in mind, I did mention board elections. Um, that process is gonna be starting next month. Um, so I'll be sending out communication to board members about what the timeline is. And then um, this is a really good time to start thinking about um, curation and board development and doing some outreach um, to make sure that we're getting a diverse pool of applicants to join our board. Um, we, let's see. And oh, and lastly, I want to make everyone aware that renewal, believe it or not, is, is coming up pretty quickly. Um, so our current bid is good through the end of 2022, which means that we need to start renewal, the renewal process next year. I am beginning to do um, some back end uh, logistics, um, but I will be reaching out to the board with that timeline and what to expect. So that's just an FYI. And with that, we're two minutes over, I apologize, but um, that's everything from staff. If board has any other comments, now's the time. Um, Robin had to drop off, so I will call the meeting to a close. Um, it is 12.02. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Ellen. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.